Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Now, with all of these skills, the only way that we can effectively teach them is if we have absolute clarity on what we're looking for as coaches. And a very basic quote, but one that I really like from a, a favorite author of mine, Robin Sharma, is clarity precedes mastery. You can't master something until you have crystal clear clarity on exactly what you want and what you're looking for, none more so than in gymnastics. Okay, so be very deliberate about the way that you're teaching skills. Be very intentional. Okay, and um, like for me, for example, I know exactly where I want the end of round off position to be. Pretty much what you're seeing here on the screen, what I call a, a C position. Okay, I've got crystal clear clarity on that. Now I know that um, at the end of a handspring, I know exactly where I want the head position to be, how wide I want the arms. I know how wide I want the arms and the transfer of weight on a round off, where I want the vision to be. All of these things help me with clarity. The more clarity I have, the more I can coach with clarity to the athlete. And the more I coach with clarity, the more clarity the athlete has on how well they understand. Now, this is a very deliberate, intentional, proactive approach to coaching. And the opposite to that is when you basically just accept what you get. You, you know, you might have a group of seven or eight kids and they all do different techniques and you just, you're just very reactive. Oh, you're bending your legs too much. You're throwing your head. This is reactive coaching. You know, you show me something and I'll tell you what you're doing wrong. I much prefer, and I find it's, uh, you know, much more impactful to have a proactive approach, which is I'm going to tell you what I want and we're going to benchmark whether you're successful or not based on what I want from you. So my, my measure of success in a round off might be, what well, is the athlete showing this C position that you can see here on screen? Is it crystal clear or are they not showing that? Is the chest out? Is the head too far back? The arms too high? Okay, I'm benchmarking what success looks like based on the crystal clear image I have in my mind about what it's supposed to look like. So you want to have absolute clarity. And the best way that you can do this, particularly in, a, in an organization like a coaching team where you've got a number of people teaching these skills is to be consistent amongst your team. You know, sit down and address this. Make sure you've all got absolute clarity and consistency amongst you about what your end of round off looks like, what your handspring finishing position looks like. Um, what you expect from a back handspring, uh, what the arms doing in a whip. There's lots of different options. Okay. What are the arms doing and the head doing in a salto forwards and backwards? There's lots of different options. Okay. Have that clarity as, as a coaching team, get some pictures, print them off, put them on the wall. You know, all these, all these things are going to help you to deliver deliberate technique to your athletes and deliberate practice. That's definitely going to help um, performance and results. So I kind of refer some uh, to these things as skill snapshots. There's certain moments when I'm when I'm teaching a skill that are really important to me and other bits which are not so important. OK, so kind of like uh, if you're watching a video, you would take a screenshot at a relevant moment. Let me just give you an example here. This is Ellie Downey performing a, a straight Ichenko. Um, obviously, she's an exceptional vaulter as a world and, and European medalist on this piece. OK, so I'd say that's a, a pretty good layout, Ichenko, as a preparation for her, her double twist or whatever she was doing on this day. There's now there's certain stages of this, which are moments, skill snapshots, which I really like to look at. So let's just take a look at what some of those are. Well, this is the first one. I'm really fussy about the hurdle position. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about the, the refinement of the technique now. Uh, we're talking about philosophy here, but the hurdle is my first skill snapshot. You want to make sure you've got absolute clarity on what that looks like for you and your coaching team. Let's find another really important moment. It's going to be this one, when the athlete is on the hands. That's very, very important to me. It tells me a lot about what's going to follow. Okay, again, you want to make sure you've got clarity on, on what needs to happen there. Okay, next position is board contact. Okay, so we've got this uh, stiff board position here. You know, I want to know where's the head position? How high are the arms? Where's the hip? How stiff are the legs? What kind of angle is the athlete entering at? And then I want to see the next position. Okay, let's look at vault contact. So that's the moment she's got her palms flat on the table, not the fingertips contacting, but the weight is now on the palms. What does that look like? How much extension is there? Where's the hip and the feet in relation to that? What's the shoulder angle look like? Where's the applied force? Is it down? Is it backwards on the table? Okay, all things which are relevant, but these are the key skill snapshots. I then want to see where is the body, okay, 
when the athlete hits the vertical position. You can see this is a an example of a great vault because she's actually left the table before her hip has reached the vertical line. This is a coaching position for me, which is so important. Okay. I would be having a gold standard example on the wall right next to your vault so your athletes can understand. If you're using using video analysis, I would be using this this position on the screen so the athlete can kind of see, you know, uh, how close to the vertical line have they been. Next relevant position to me is the is the upright position. What does the body look like there? Now, if this was just a layout Yuchenko that was being competed, you'd want it to be a bit straighter, of course. But I think we'll forgive Ellie here for preparing her double twist this way, because this is how she likes to, to prepare the vault. It's absolutely irrelevant that she's got a slight close hip angle, because she's not doing this for the purpose of a layout Yuchenko, of course. She's doing this for the benefit of, uh, of a double twist. All right, so that's our skill snapshots. So start to think about yours. Think about yours within your pillars. Get the clarity there first. If you don't have clarity in your head or there's some confusion, you're probably going to struggle to get that message across to your athletes. So it's always super important that we train with intent because we're always going to get much better results. Okay, so we've got a uh, emphasis here on the six pillars of acrobatics and we've got an emphasis on it, the specific shapes and positions that we're looking for. And that combined is a really powerful combination. Okay, another quote that I really like, another cooking quote. So a recipe has no soul. You as the cook must bring the soul to the recipe. And I think that it's easy to, to believe. And, and actually, you know, the reality is that some of these, uh, some of the pillars, they're not particularly enjoyable to, to teach and to coach. You know, some of them are frustrating. They're mundane. <laughs> they could be a bit boring, particularly for an athlete. If we're placing great emphasis on such um, non-exciting elements, they might, they much would rather do double backs and twists and things like that. So it's our job as coaches to make sure that we're making it as enjoyable as possible. So we're bringing that soul to training. We're having some fun with it. And, you know, one of the best ways that we can do that, of course, is variety, teaching uh, these skills in a variety of different ways. So two phrases I like to use would be repetition without repetition and the same but different. You know, you're teaching the same skill, a round off, but you're teaching it in different ways um, or through different methods, I should say, not, not a different technique, of course. I don't necessarily encourage you do this within the same session, you know, using dozens of different drills. In fact, I'd probably encourage you to not do that. I discourage it. What I think is good is to have a, a collection or a variety of drills that you can leverage and use at different times of the year or maybe on different weeks. And that way the athlete won't get too bored of, of performing and refining some of these basic pillars, for example. And hopefully they understand that actually learning and refining those skills will help them to achieve the bigger skills. So, uh, you know, if they want to get to the fun stuff, the more enjoyable things, they're, they're going to need to have a better layout, a better round off, a better back handspring, for example. So just have a little think, you know, are there things that you can take away out of your program? Um, you know, things that you don't really serve you too well, that you don't gain a lot from. And by doing so, we can actually make our program better. So that concept is addition by subtraction. The program improves by taking things out rather than putting things in. And you start to uh, divert more of your attention and focus on a finite number of skills. OK, like that Italian chef cooking fresh pasta with you know, eggs and flour and things like that. Finite number of ingredients. But what they can do with that is remarkable. So really think about, you know, what drills do you actually need to be doing? So we get to the beam. We do our stretching. We do our active flex. And now we're going to start with our complexes. And right now at this part of season, my complexes are a lot of single leg work a lot of single leg landings a lot of single leg jumping a lot of single leg balancing and that's because on balance beam most of our stuff a lot of our stuff is single leg right we land our series single leg we land our aerial single leg we take off our series single leg we land most leaps single leg and we take off single leg and so i really strongly think that these kids need to be so confident and strong and stable jumping and landing on one foot in all of the positions, in all of the directions. And so a lot of my complexes are involving that. And particularly for the younger kids, 
I want them to feel like as I land, I'm engaging my muscles. I'm landing toe ball heel. I feel my glutes and my quads and my abs and everything engaging to help me balance and readjust versus the little kids tend to just like to plop on the beam and pray that they were straight and hope that it works out. So I, I'm trying to teach them to work through their feet and work the beam to help them land. So some things you'll see, just regular single leg jumps in a coupe or a passe. I'm looking for maximum amplitude, airtime, pushing through the foot, extension, and then when they land, land toe ball, heel, absorb, stable in the knee. I don't want this wobbly knee everywhere. Um, I want feet parallel. I don't want it turned in. I don't want it turned out. I want it parallel with the beam. As we're tumbling along the beam, the more parallel we are, the more we connect stuff. When we start letting that back hip turn out, it's hard to make connections out of that. Arabesque jumps, um, again, max amplitude. You can do it with arms pulled back. So for leaps, right, it would look like landing a switch leap on one leg and you can do arabesque jumps forward and back in that position. Or you can do it with chest round, arms narrow, as if you were landing out of a back handspring step out but hadn't gotten your back leg down yet. Hop forward and back. Again, keep the knee tracking over the toes, feet parallel with the beam. Um, and again, both legs, everything on both legs, everything forward, everything backwards, everything right, everything left, because various skills land on different legs. They need to be confident in both, but also we wanna keep balance in our body. We don't wanna get one leg super strong and not the other leg, prevents injuries, um, all of that stuff. Also a lot of levers, um, super square levers, holding the positions, feeling the muscles, working the muscles, because when we land, we come out in levers. I do mine with a bent bottom leg because I feel like when it's locked, they're just balancing on their knee and they're not actually finding those muscles that are needed to land safely. You could do bent leg skips, straight leg skips, scissor runs, mini leaps, deer runs. Be creative in finding ways to get athletes taking off and landing with confidence before they leap and tumble. So here's just some examples. Regular old group of level six sevens. I'd like to see the ribs in a little more, but they're jumping, right? They're trying to keep their legs stable when they land. If they can't do this, they can't, they're they not going to be confident to switch sleep. They're not going to be confident to do a back handspring step out one leg. They're not going to be confident for sure to do aerials and layout step outs. So we do them forward. We do them backwards. These are some little level fours, right? They're doing a pretty good job. They're getting up there. They're looking at the beam. They're working to not wobble or fall. They're learning to engage their muscles and make it work. Lever. So she does a pretty good, this is way more challenging than it looks. And the slower you do it, the more challenging it is. Her hip is very square. If you were looking from the back, it's not tilted at all. Her knee is perfectly aligned over the beam, over her toes. We do five to 10 of those. And then we also do, this next kid's going to do it to the three landing positions that we practice. Um, but you'll notice when she starts, her hip is very, very turned out and rolled out. And that's what you're going to see from almost all kids when you start this. Their hips are turned out. So you can see her hip is popped and then she rolls it back in. So she's doing a lever. I call that a point. She does a lever to a bent leg lock, which we will discuss in a minute. And she does a lever to a lunge. And I love the lever because it just teaches them to be strong on that front foot and not just plop down to the back leg. Landing positions. So I do a bent leg lock, which is a little controversial and that's okay. We can all have our own opinions, but my why, if you watch kids tumble on floor, they tumble from this C shape, right? And we teach the round off. We wanna go round off to round so that we can snap and do whatever we want next out of it. We don't want to do round off to straight up and down and we don't wanna do back handspring to straight up and down because then we, our second skill is coming from a dead shape. So I teach the same thing on beam. I don't want to do my round off to straight up and down or my back handspring to straight up and down because then the only way I can do my next flip is by throwing my head or buckling my knees or what have you. So I'm trying to keep it consistent across beam and floor. I also think it's easier for the athletes to watch both feet land on the beam. if They're focused on staying down a little longer when they try to rush and stand up tall really, really fast. Then they often don't see that second foot hit the beam and that can lead to slipping a foot or turning it out um, and a little bit of inconsistencies. So I really teach bent leg lock for connections. 
if you're finishing your skill, I'm okay if you pull nice and tall and finish. Um, and for compulsory, obviously we finish nice and tall, but for the purpose of connecting my skills, I teach a bent leg lock. Um, I'll show it to you, it's in this video. Then I teach a lunge, it's aesthetically pleasing and it's a nice solid finish position with a wide base of support that they can feel really strong in. And then I teach a point, it reinforces the stable first leg and placing your back foot down versus just rushing to get it down or just letting it collapse down. Um, so this is what we do. So we do a ton of this stuff every day. We do it. Handstand, show control, little narrow split with flat hips. And she steps down, bent leg lock. And so if you watch this, right, this is similar, not exactly the same, but similar to how I would have my kids finish their round off on floor, right? If she was going to fly out of this, then her legs would be a little more in front. Um, but because I'm asking her to stop, they're underneath her. But from here, she has all this energy. She can drive through her legs and throw her arms and her shoulders. And she could do another back handspring, a layout step out, a back handspring, a true layout, an Arabian, whatever you want from this position versus if she was straight up and down, what could she do? So starting from here, she could do anything. Starting from straight up and down, it would be very difficult without bending or adding an arm swing or whatever to get her to do a skill. So starting in this position allows me to teach the kids a slower connection that they can build up as they get confident. Next, I believe she should go to a point, but I actually think she might do a lunge. Let's look. she does do a point. So again, she's very stable on this front leg. Her eyes are watching her front foot land. She's balanced. From here, she can place her back leg and do whatever she wants. I would actually probably have her hands pointing down a little more so that when her foot does come in, it's more like that first C shape. But ah, this is what she gave me. Um, and then the third one, is she's gonna kick up let's go through it a little faster and she's gonna watch both feet land both feet and then lunge very safe very secure very rep replicative replicable repeatable she can repeat that and so we do that every day they do handstand step down right leg and left leg lock lunge point cartwheel Lock lunge point, good arm cartwheel, lock lunge point, bad arm cartwheel, lock lunge point. We don't do walkovers every single day, but when they do them, lock lunge point, back handspring step outs, lock lunge point. And even if you're a little level three or level four and you're just starting your back handsprings, they do them up to panel mats or up to eight inches to lock lunge point. I just, we do it every day. And then from there, we just combine it. Handstand, watch my feet land, straight jump. Cartwheel, straight jump, back walk over, straight jump, handstand, back walk over, handstand, back handspring. We just combine it in all of the ways that you could think of doing it. And as they get more confident and as they're consistent, then they progress to the next step. And we're always just adding on. So it's not a big deal. Like that's just what we do next. And they're always working ahead of their level and pushing harder on the floor and laser beams. So if we're doing handstand, back handspring on the high beam, they're probably doing back handspring, back handspring on the laser beam, or even back handspring, back handspring, back handspring on the laser beam. And my thought process is, if you're always doing more somewhere else than whatever you're doing on the high beam, oh, that's just my easy stuff. Like I can do back handspring, back handspring. So handstand, back handspring is easy. So here's a group of level fours and fives, and they're just kind of going through the circuit. They kick to handstand, they step down, they show me good support on their front leg and then they close it up and they should be watching both feet land front and back you'll see some of them pick their heads up a little quick this one they step down they watch their feet land and they jump and that jump will become a back handspring right so teach a tap swing bef uh, bail before cast a bail Okay, so uh, I think this is really important. Um, the tap swing teaches the athlete to create their own power and turnover rather than rely on the speed from a cast fall. Okay, and uh, it allows them to, to really feel the bottom of the bar 
feel the heavy hang at the bottom and create that nice little scoop that's going to give them the turnover power. It's going to get them to lift and, and get upside down to the handstand. Um, the uh, tap swing actually allows them to kill down a little bit more of their power from the cast too uh, and allows or from the handstand and allows them to put in whatever power they feel necessary at the time. Um, they also allow for athletes to transition easily between handstands and uh, direct connections from Maloney's, Shapash's, Chow's, um, any of your uh, low to high flights. Um, the uh, faster you turn over using a tap also allows for a quicker release of the bar and ultimately a safer bail handstand because it's going to get to the bar quicker and it's going to get to the bar on a flatter angle. So it's not going to do any dropping through the handstand or it's not going to potentially miss the bar high. And then also, um, you know, as a coach, it's easy to help control the athlete and it's easy to help control the timing of the, uh, the skill for the athlete when it is a little bit slower from the tap swing um, versus the increased speed of the handstand fall. Um, it really helps the athlete feel some of the opening of the tap. It helps them feel the one to release of the hands. Um, so then I would move straight from tap swing bail handstands to cast bail hands, um, or excuse me, cast handstand bail, I should say. And um, I would avoid short casts, uh, and the reason why is uh, the tap swing bail, you can really find the bottom of the bar, and you can find that good uh, uh, toes down stretch and, and good tap. The handstand, if you planch the shoulders a little bit and you create kind of a hollow down and then get those toes down, you can still feel that nice late, uh, late tap through the bottom. Uh, the short cast Athletes have to really push back to create pressure on the drop. And so more often than not, this is going to create an earlier tap on the backside of the bar because the body's going to naturally, uh, it's going to push out and get straight. And then it's going to try to, uh, it's going to open early through the tap. And then at, at vertical, um, it's going to want to straighten that back out. So it's going to cause an earlier uh, second part of the tap or an earlier kick. Uh, then you have to hang on. So you can actually get lift to the bar and then you have no rotation. So it just takes away the opportunity to get that good one, two uh, upside down rotation. So the one, two release of the hands, um, I think this really helps initiate the body turn and allow for easier rotation upon exit of the bar. Uh, shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So one, two reach allows the athlete to get their first hand to the bar as quickly as possible. So less airtime equals less risk, right? Um, but the best part is the, the initiation of the first quarter turn of the body towards the low bar through the one, two release, uh, the hand and the shoulder reach and that turn creates twist and the rest of the body can be very tight and held in one piece. So if you scoop up and you get to the hollow right past the bar, you do a one hand release and you just keep the body totally tight and straight or just very ever so slightly tight hollow. Um, then the, the turn is happening through the shoulders and uh, you don't have to segment the body at all. So when an athlete tries to turn their hips or turn their feet and they leave the hands together on the bar, they're actively segmenting their body in the turn. And so most athletes are gonna struggle with, um, once they segment, it's gonna be really hard for them to come back together and create like a, a tight shape at the end of the skill. Um, I try to talk to our kids about uh, you should try to be 100% maximum body tension in the air before you get to the bar so that when you get to the bar, you are ready to withstand the forces of that contact um, and stopping that rotation. And unfortunately, if you're segmented, it's going to be really hard for you to find that that 100% body tension. And therefore, you're probably going to have some um, some some laxity when you hit the bar. Uh, first hand releasing right at the toes passing of the low bar also allows the athlete to look at the bar for like the entire skill, right? You can see it pretty much the whole time, which makes it uh, way easier for kids to, to direct themselves right at it. So how do we start? We hang on a low bar. We practice our one arm release. Okay. You can do this by grabbing the legs. You can do this by... Um, by putting the legs on a, on a corner of a block. Um, you know, there's, there's, you don't have to hold them up like I'm doing for the second part though. 
okay? You're gonna see that I am grabbing the back shoulder, okay? So as she does this turn, okay, we're gonna go reach forward, looking at my far foot, okay? Hand is on the back shoulder, release the second hand. They flow right underneath their feet to a handstand, check the body tension, okay? But the goal is that from here it is a, you don't drop straight down, you drop forward, look at the foot, reach for it, and then boom, rotate underneath it. Okay, steps three, tap swings to one arm reach, stop. Slow travel to handstand, okay? Tap swings to slow travel with quicker second hand release and then tap swing straight to bail handstand. Okay, so you can kind of see in this sequence just the general uh, speed change. Okay, obviously the first one is uh, slow. This is hard to spot, but it's a very effective measure. The next one is they get right to the very edge. So it's, it's, a, it's a slow down. Okay, but it's a release before they truly get stopped. And then the last one, okay, is just a natural flow right to the bar. And I mean, that's just a nice little tap swing bail hand. It's a really good action to build everything off of. Okay, step six, kip cast handstand and then kill down to tap swing. Okay, and then step seven, kip cast handstand to bail handstand. Uh, the kill down to the tap swing you can do while you're doing the tap swing bail hands. Um, you can kind of work them, uh, you know, at the same time. And then when it's ready and the tap swing bail handstand is ready, then it's pretty easy to kip cast handstand, come down, bail hand. Okay. Um, and this is just going to be a few examples of handstand bail hands. Okay. A number of different athletes that I've kind of coached through the years. You can all see the one, two. They have a different varying measure of hips through the bottom, depending on how fast they are. Um, this one is pretty exceptional. Boom locks and really great handstand hold out of it. And I'll go through all the details here, but it feels the bottom toes and you can see her really looking at that bar and there's a really great separation of the one, two, hits in, locks in, pretty cool. So the Maloney bail combo is a great reason to develop the tap swing bail handstand as well. Boom, nice little bail hand. Um, it's uh, the toe hand Maloney bail hand is 5 tenth combo at level 10. So boom, you've built all of your bonus, you know, now throw in an E dismount and you've got a you've got a 10-1 routine. Um, that you could probably do pretty, pretty well. So all this sounds great, but I can't spot like you. And I would say to that at one point, I couldn't either. You know, I remember, I remember fumbling kids around and, and, you know, and struggling a little bit, but here's your options. Don't learn to spot like me, um, learn to do it, or you can mix the spotting methods and progressions to suit you. Okay. And your specific skill set or your strength or your ability or whatever, you know, however you want to, you want to word that. Right. Um, and so this method that I was talking about and these steps have proven super effective with a lot of athletes. So it's my suggested path. Um, but also, um, you know, it's, it's not the only way. So there's kind of like a second pathway that I use. And I use this in conjunction with some kids who have trouble um, doing a little too much of the one, two, and they'll turn over and they'll get kind of stuck and they'll, they'll actually overturn the handstand sometimes. So this is a good way to get them going and make them feel that flight across the bar. So we do <clears throat> tap swing to flat back, tap swing to quarter turn. Then we're doing like a tap swing quarter turn to like a three quarter turnover, right? So it's a little bit too aggressive, but this girl was already doing bail handstands and stuff. So um, that was trying to hold back a little bit. Boom, handstand, and then handstand come through and bail handstand. Um, but just allowing them to kind of learn that flight across the bar so that they're getting those hips moving, um, 
doing the same thing. Then we're getting the hips moving and then the quarter turn. Okay. Trying to incorporate a little more of the one, two here. All the way. And handstand. So, like I said, we don't always have the most time at vault because it's one scale. You're like, oh, I can't waste all this time on vault. We got to be on bars. We got to be on bars. We got to be on bars. And I understand that because bars take a lot of time because it's totally different than every other event. But what can you do the whole rest of practice at every event all the time during warm up, at conditioning, during every other event that's going to automatically make your kids better vaulters? So, you don't always have to make your kids good vaulters while you're at vault. You can do it all the time. Body tension, working on body tension, lying handstands, uh, handstands at every angle. You can do that anywhere. Maximum extension, explaining to your kids what maximum extension means. So really extending through the shoulders, covering up all that space there and having a conditioning program that works. Because if your kids are not physically prepared to be good vaulters, they will not be good vaulters. And you don't always have to condition at vault. Your conditioning can be at the end of practice, at the beginning of practice, that's really up to you. But consult a professional if you don't know what to do to make a conditioning program that's going to make your kids stronger, more powerful, have longer endurance, all of those things. Um, that's like the best thing I did for my program is outsource that. Um, and it really, really makes a huge difference if you have a conditioning program that works and if your kids are physically prepared to do good front handspring vaults. Um, here is lying handstands, body tension. We love to use partners always because if, oh wait, hang on, I gotta pause it. Because if they are not actually doing it, they are watching their partner and they're helping their partner and then they're still learning. And again, we love to be super efficient. That is like the theme of our gym, efficiency, 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 all the time with our team practices. And you can be learning by watching. And so we have partners all the time when we do body tension. I also absolutely love these. Um, these are the tumble track slanted ninja steps. We use them for body tension all the time. You can watch, my girls kind of struggle with it here. Um, that's why they're doing that kind of bouncing up and down thing. That's not what I really want them to do. Um, Oh, it's going to start over. That's not what I really want them to do. I want them to just maintain a nice straight line, but they are kind of struggling with this, but they're trying to get that line, covering the ears, looking at the hands. They're doing that bouncing up and down thing because they're trying to figure out which muscles to contract. Now, again, we're using partners here because they're still learning if their partners are helping check them. We always say we check them, check them. They will make sure that their core is tense. Sometimes they'll poke their quads to make sure their quads are tense. Gently try and tug their feet apart and make sure that is tense. Body tension all the time. No matter where, where you are, what event you're on, if you constantly work body tension, I guarantee your kids will get better at vault without even having to go to vault practice. Um, so that is really effective. And I wanted to show a good example again of maximum, maximum extension. extension. So, covering your ears. so there is no space between your shoulders between and her ears there. here. Pushing, she pushing, is pushing, really pushing, pushing, pushing down, squeezing nice, nice and tight. Um, so that's good maximum extension. Few words and phrases. So it's one thing to understand what a good front handspring vault is and how to get there, but it's another thing to communicate it to your kids. That's the thing about coaching, right? Especially with front handspring vaults because you've got younger kids with compulsory girls. Um, so my best advice is not to tell your kids what they're doing wrong because if you tell your kids what they're doing wrong, that eliminates one option. Then they say, oh, so I can't do that. Okay, got it. There's a ton of other things I can do though. So what we want to do is narrow it down for them and simplify it for them and tell them exactly what we want to see done correctly. And this way, if they can pinpoint that, say, and you give them clear expectations, this is what I am looking for and this would be correct, then it eliminates all the wrong options. But if you give them, this is what you're doing wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, there's so many other things that they can do. Um, so we want to tell them what we want rather than tell them what is wrong. And so a lot of times I hear coaches saying, you're stuttering, you're stuttering. Those are stutter steps. And so instead of doing something like that, talk to your kids about what you want to see. Cause what do you want besides stutter steps? They might not know. They might not know what you're actually looking for. And so the thing that I say to my kids is have long, even steps. And I explain to them every step you take down the vault runway, I want it to be about the same length. Maybe the first one's 
little different because they're starting to gain speed. First few are a little different. But then after that, once they've got the speed up, every single step is the same length. And one of the things that I do is I'll line my kids up and I'll have them do a race. And I tell half the kids, they're only allowed to take tiny, tiny steps. And they can move as fast as they want, but they can only take tiny steps. And I tell the other half the kids, you guys can take long steps. And then I say, ready, set, go. And who wins every single time? The kids get, can take the long steps. And so I tell them, don't you want to approach this table quickly? Because that is what is going to make you a better vaulter. It's approaching the table very quickly. And that's what I want is the long, even steps. And that just flips in their brain for them. Um, instead of saying, don't pike, don't pike, don't pike. You're piking in the first half. You're piking in the first half. A lot of times that comes from the chest being down on the board. Um, and so I say, chest back on the board, chest back on the board. Um, and that helps them to better visualize. And if they're not understanding when you're saying you need to figure out their, their learning style. And so stand behind them, put your hands here, let them lean back into you, hold them and jump them on the springboard, let them feel it, let them watch another teammate. Um, and, then, and then continue to say chest back so that they can associate that with what you're doing. Maximum extension, no space between the shoulders and the ears. So don't just say, oh, I watched the shift presentation. I'm going to go back. I'm going to tell all my kids to use maximum extension because they might not understand what that means if those are not terms that you use with them all the time. We use that term all the way through in our toddler program, in our preteen program, our lower level team program. We teach them what it means. So you can't just say these foreign words to them that they're not going to understand. What I do with maximum extension is I usually put my hands here on them and I have them smush my hands and I'm like I can't have any space there so if they're doing this I'm like I don't want to see any space don't want to see any space maximum extension right um body tension you want to use that phrase with them as well but again they're not going to just automatically understand what that means so if you're saying to your kids oh you have to be more tense you have to be more tense use your body tension and they and they just are looking at you like you have three heads or you want to communicate with your athletes and say, do you understand what I mean by that? Like look at them and, and ask them and they should not be scared to say no. Because if they say no, then, then that's our job to do better for them, right? Um, but I will like take like a cord or a string or a band um, and I just put it out to the side and move my arms back and forth. And if they're not tense, I say, this is not tense. This is not tense, it's wiggling all around and I don't want wiggly vaulters. And I show, this is tense and I pull it. And then I move my hands the exact same way. And I'm like, look what's happening. This is how I want your vault to be. A nice straight line. So if we're not tense and we're loose, then we're going to wiggle around when we vault. But if I pull it and we are tense, then we're going to have really awesome vaults. And then I hand it to them. And I let them try. And then I show them with a the kid. I say, get really loose. And I try to pull their feet up. And I show them what happens. I say, okay, get really tight. And I pull their feet up lift them into that handstand I show them what happens so you have to be explaining these things to them so that it's so much second nature to them to understand when I say body tension they go and they tighten up really 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 tense it has to happen that quick it has to fire that quickly and that's only going to happen if you really work at the understanding of these terms with them I love hold your line um, we talk about holding your handstand line right and so again like I I use a kid, I don't have a kid with me, but um, <laughs> holding the handstand line and I, I show it to him and I'm like, okay, now break your line. I kind of will whisper to him, like, you're gonna do a bad job this time. They love to do a bad job. That's so fun for them. I'm like, do a bad job, pike a lot. And then they're like, oh, and I'm like, oh no, what happened to our line? Our line is broken. And I just say fun things to them. Like you're folding like origami and they just crack up and think I'm the funniest thing ever. Um, but yeah, you want to say, hold your line, hold your line, hold your line. Instead of just giving them everything they're doing wrong, tell them what you want them to do correctly. And then without fail, go fast, stay tight, always applies. Go fast, stay tight, go fast, stay tight. You want to, if you don't know what to say, go fast, stay tight will always work because you know what? I have never, ever, ever in 13 years of coaching had to look at a kid and say, you know what? Your vault, I think you're going too fast and I think you're staying too tight. Okay, and I'm sure you all 
feel the same about that. Feeling that. Have a look here, you'll see an athlete who's starting standing on those two boxes. And I like this because it's an extension of that drill I've already taught them. So they're standing on the boxes. Now what we normally do is they jump off, they swing and they giant back around to stand on the boxes again with the coach spotting. This athlete is actually demonstrating it once he's, he's already been doing those progressions and now he's just trying a bunch in a row. You can see the shape coming over like a front support, which is on purpose. Um, but I really like the progression of actually stopping on the boxes. And then we sometimes do, okay, stop on the boxes, jump, do one, stop on the box, jump, do two, stop on the box. So you can start to increase how many giants they do between each attempt. The Tower of Power. So it's a good name for it as well. The kids love it. Circle and over, over, over. And then you'll see at the end, I think he, of uh, this one, I think he stands, one of these, he stands on the boxes like that. And so that would, that standing on the box would be kind of what it would look like if they were doing it um, one at a time. He would land and stand. One thing I'll mention with this is again, you'll see I'm teaching him to scoop over and go over the bar because initially when I taught Giants, I tried teaching from a handstand back to a handstand and I just had like a year, two years of athletes that couldn't quite make it and push off. Uh, now I don't have that problem. They all learn to create rotation over the bar first. So lengthening their body up towards handstand often qu happens quite easily. So this is for me, it's been a much faster method. Now, what you're going to see is I've slightly missed that. So now I'm holding this athlete up in that stretched front support, 45 degree handstand sort of position, and I'm going to throw him and then catch him back in that shape again. So watch the spotting as well. I've got my hands on his legs, hands on his shoulders. Push him out. Now the first time, and I've never spotted one of these athletes before and they're scared, I'll often just push them out into a swing and then I'll push them out into a swing towards candle and maybe I'll grab their hips and then let them go again and swing again. And then I'll push them out, I'll grab their hips like I am with this athlete here, like a sandwich, and I lift them onto my shoulder. So they feel very secure there. I've basically got the middle of their body, their legs are resting on my shoulder. So for an athlete that's scared, this is a great way to slowly introduce them to going around the bar. And then I change that, so I'm going to swap back to my normal grip. And I believe I go straight into the other way of spotting now. Yeah, so hands and shoulders is the next step of spotting this skill. Uh, I've put this, by the way, as optional. I've said this is, this is what I call three-quarter giants. Uh, and I've written optional. And I say optional because you might not be strong enough to spot this, okay? Uh, I'm blessed with massive arms, what can I say? But use the boxes. So that's where the boxes come into play and you can even double spot this onto the boxes. So that, that's what I would do if I didn't have the strength to hold them up or when I have older athletes that are coming into the sport late or something, I start them on boxes. Younger athletes, I find this to be a really fast method. So here, this little guy does quite a good job of staying tight. Actually, I was really happy with these. He's lacking a bit of power, but you can see he's got pretty good body tension and shapes as we do this. And that extra power would come from maybe tapping a little bit harder I'm also to, I'm cueing things like looking at his feet in this moment and keeping his hips straight as we go over. And then this is Christian who can already do these quite well. And we're just doing these faster now so you can start to see what shaping might look like at speed. Okay, and we have already seen this clip so it's gonna go quickly, but then we've got the front giant as well. Now, what I'll just mention is back giant's very technical. I take my time. I do a lot of spotting. We do one at a time. Um, front giant's, to be honest, at, at the initial stages, you don't need to be that technical. You can just stay really long and straight and then dish on the way up and you can probably make it over. So what I do is I teach good swings. I start doing 45 to 45. So I turn the, like three quarter giants. I start doing work on that. Then I'll also just play around with like, maybe they go to 45 and I put them in the handstand and swing them back the other way. So I teach a few front giants, just telling them to stay tight, dish their body. And I spot them through that. Then I'm happy once, they're, once their swings are strong, they've had some experience going over the bar. I then allow them to play with doing front giants by themselves, like this athlete has, let them just build their swings and see if they can get over more for a confidence thing, while at the same time, I'm encouraged their backward giants. I'm hoping that postman doesn't come up here today. Yep, no, we're good. Okay, so, um, so that's what he's just done. He's built it up and he's gone over the bar. Next, building to full giants. Okay, so you can just see some extra shaping drills. So now we're in, that's quite a long shape, which is why I included that. So we're less, less of a round shape, it's a bit longer. You can see I'm spotting them still and we just start to build it up higher. So he's got rotation and then I let him go higher over the top. 
So he's now doing full giants. I'm spotting occasionally. And what you'll see in a second here, oh, I lost it. Here, what I'm actually doing is I'm not just, it looks like I'm helping him, but what I'm actually trying to do is make him arch. I'm trying to push on his back and his legs and trying to force him into an awkward bad shape. And he has to actually have his muscles switched on to fight against that and hold that position. So that's, what, that's what's happening there. So I'm actually making life harder for him, not easier. Um, and that's to encourage that dish shape over the top. Then we go handstand to handstand. So this is a very great technical sort of thing. You can do like 20 of these. It's really good for their shoulder strength, their body shaping, their endurance. As a coach, you can spot it and really fine tune different positions. Like I'm already seeing here, if you watch Christian at the front, he this one's better, but he was a little bit piked on the one before. Now he's got hips a bit straighter. So you can start to really fine tune their shapes during that one. So handstand to handstand is really good as well. Uh, flyaways. Okay. So teaching flyaways. So this is the like ideal model and concepts that we're going to go through. So I'll, I'll show you this one's from a swing and then we see one from, I think a handstand. So swing. Okay. Obviously I've helped him a bit there. So we're swinging to about horizontal dish arch back to that candle dish shape and rotating over. Good, and then the next one is from the giant. Okay, and that's a pretty good one. So again, we'll see it in slow motion. So he's stretching, keeping his head nice and still. Feet go up high, he's going above the bar, so his shoulders are rising above the bar. So that should score quite well in competition. And it, for me, biggest thing is it's very consistent. This, this athlete is quite consistent at flyaway, and it's very safe. And initially he had a lot of fear of flyaways because at another club he'd hit the bar a bunch of times. And so we, we had to go back and we rebuilt this gradually through the process you're about to see. So the tap begins a little bit earlier than a normal swing, at about 45 or 30 degrees, because we wanna bend the bar a bit earlier so we get sent away a little bit earlier. Lazy flyaway is a concept that I teach. So especially for the swing variation of this, I don't want a ton of rotation. Athletes love to try really hard and they pull on the bar and they create too much rotation or they come too close to the bar. I want what's called a lazy flyaway where it's mostly just done through the tap, that the change of shape into a dish and it's more calm and it's flowy and consistent. I'm looking for consistency here to build confidence. The change in the body line creates the rotation. So going from that arch to the dish is what actually creates the lift and rotation there, okay? So we'll see that uh, done poorly a few times and we'll see that done well. Avoid using shoulder angle change to create rotation. So a really effective way to create rotation is to pull on the bar. It's very effective. You will create tons of rotation, but it also can move your legs to the bar and you can hit them. And once that happens, athletes have a lot of fear. So this whole method is designed around consistency, calm flyaways that don't create fear. That's what I want there. Um, and I'm very picky and methodical at this stage. I do not experiment too much. I don't gamble on this. I take my time because I don't, I have had athletes that have been um, scared of flyaways because of bad incidences that have then quit the sport not long after. So this one can, like a bad flyaway can actually ruin a gymnastics career. So we got to make sure that we're very methi methodical and picky with this. Uh, fly away progression. So swing to candle and dead cow. So we'll have a look at that. So what I'm doing is we're swinging up into a candlestick shape and then dropping to our back. Boom. That's a really good one. So I like that. Watch, he really gets his toes up and he's actually, he starts to rotate. Starts to flip. And this is key for this drill. What I tell the athletes is in that moment, my job is to stop you from rotating. Your job is to try to land on your head. <laughs> you know, try to actually kick the toes up and get your body rotating. And then I'll stop you by putting my hands under the shoulders like I've done. You can't, you won't get any uh, progress for this by just sending them off to do this by themselves into a pit. Because if they did it properly, they'd land on their neck, right? You want to do this one where you're spotting them and you're stalling their rotation. If you do too many without that, they'll arch their body, they'll swing out horizontal, and it doesn't actually help, in my opinion, with a flyaway. Um, for smaller athletes, I think I might show this. They, I catch them and I rotate them. I think I try it. Is it this one? Yep, so I catch them and then this is, yeah, and then I think... I think, oh yeah, yeah, you can see this. This one didn't work very well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip him now. And 
What I, I used to do that one a lot with younger kids into pits. So I'd actually catch them in their flyaway and I could throw them away from the bar. It's a little bit awkward at Christian size without a pit and on boxes that moved, it didn't work so well. So we don't have good footage of that, uh, but that's a really helpful thing. Um, what is he gonna do now? Yeah, so then the next step is to do the flyaway. So I've done a whole lot where I've caught them. I'm confident. I tell them you're ready to turn it over. And then on this one, he kicks into the flyaway shape and I actually like spot him on the on his belly and back into a cross position and, and I go off with them. So I've got control the whole time. So have a look at that. As you can see, I actually go off with them. Okay, this is a good one I find because I'm quite nimble. Um, it's a great one to get them to actually feel confidence in this one um, and it takes away a lot of the fear because they know I've, I've got them. I can really pull them. I can do a lot to help them.